Uh, my name is Michelle Whitney, and I oversee enterprise data management reporting for the Girl Scouts. Um, so that includes headquarters, but also we have 112 councils spread across the entire um, country, um, and we have them parsed out into individual councils. So talking about the whole group. Okay, should I push the button to move? All right, great. So first of all, how many people in the room, how many women in the room participated in Girl Scouts at any level when you were kids? Right on, welcome. Um, okay, so everyone else in the room, how many of you have Girl Scouts in your family at any level, anyone? All right, awesome. Okay, last question, how many people have had Girl Scout cookies? We get you one way or the other, I mean, we really try to. So. Uh, Girl Scouts is really known, I think, probably for our cookies, but we really hope that you come to understand that we are a whole lot more than that. We are the number one preeminent leadership development organization for girls. Um, and the proof is in the data. You can see on the right-hand side some of our quick stats. Um, we know that we are developing the future female leaders uh, for tomorrow. Um, more than 70% uh, of our female U.S. Sen uh, senators today are former Girl Scouts. I hope to see that percentage go up next month. Um, all three of our former secretaries of state, Girl Scouts, 77% uh, of female leaders in the technology sector, um, also Girl Scouts. I think we just went forward. Um, and also, importantly, every woman who has ever gone to space, a Girl Scout. So um, not a surprise to see the number of hands in the room because roughly half of all American women participated at some level or another as girls. So that's 59 million alums out there in the United States. That's pretty massive. You can imagine the data management challenges there. So no disrespect to any of you, but we have the very best customers in the entire world. They are the best, and they are wholly digital, digitally native, um, and increasingly so are their parents, which makes me feel slightly old, but it's true, increasingly so are their parents. So when you have the very best customers in the world, you have to make sure that you are evolving to meet their growing needs, right? And when you understand, um, the, the impact of the program that you're delivering, that becomes an imperative because we need more female voices in leadership. So, doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that data is the fuel of digital transformation. Luckily for us, our CEO is a former uh, NASA data, uh, excuse me, um, rocket scientist, so she understands data. And she is super pumped about what we're doing with Looker. When we rolled it out to her, she said to me, this is like candy. So that's what you want your CEO to say. I said, look forward to more candy. So let's talk about where we've been. Um, so uh, the story of Girl Scouts is really that we have for-profit problems with a nonprofit budget. And I share that with every vendor we ever um, approach to work with. Uh, because we still have the exact same challenges as if we were a Fortune 10 company, but we don't have the budget to be able to address them in the same ways. So um, in data, when you have 59 million alum, you've got some decisions that you have to make. So for you young people in the audience, data used to be prohibitively expensive to maintain, right? Um, not, that, not that long ago. So Girl Scouts had to make decisions about how we were maintaining that data. And so the legacy data warehouse was really focused on being able to answer what I call right now questions, right? What's happening today versus this time last year, right? So because of that, it really only maintained summary level data, which again, you can answer right now questions, but that's all you can answer. So uh, on top of that, we had a legacy system, a business objects webby system. Nothing wrong with that, but it's old tech, right? And the system was so um, tough for most users to try and interact with that there are two things that maybe aren't super surprising. 
Um, the first is that when we did a user survey, 95% of our users said they did not feel comfortable answering new questions in the system. Why? Because the barrier of entry was too high from a tech perspective, right? Um, the other thing is that we learned pretty quickly that the number three most frequently used report was used to download data and then answer questions in Excel. And I know that because I was a user before I took over the system, right? Um, so these are things that we knew we had to explode if we were really truly going to be using our data to drive our business. So enter projects more data. Now, first of all, I'm going to say, <laughs> um, first of all, if Android can do it, we can do it. Um, but also, especially when you're working on projects that in involve a lot of change management, what you call things really matters, right? So I have always found that a really stupid dad joke goes a really long way because how can you possibly be frightened or intimidated by something called projects more data? You can't. It's not humanly possible. Uh, it also made us laugh. So projects more data, what did we do? Um, very first thing we needed to do was to completely re-architect our data warehouse. So we went back to each of the source systems and extracted data right down to the transactional level. I was really hoping we'd get maybe 10 years. We got 14 years. Um, so super exciting because that gives us our very first cohort of girls who started when they were daisies and went all the way through the program. So huge for us. Um, we uh, went looking for a new system. Uh, spoiler alert, it's Looker. Uh, maybe you figured that out because I'm talking at a Looker conference. Um, but it was super important for us to find something where we could change the nature of our question asking and change it from being you had to have the tech technical skills to answer the question to instead being good at answering, uh, excuse me, asking questions in the first place, right? That should be. Um, the determination. So enter Looker. Um, and then data democratization. So if 95% of people don't feel comfortable asking new questions, who do you think they're getting to ask the questions for them? Right? There are only so many people on my data team. Um, so we knew that we needed to explode that. What we really needed to do was empower users to feel comfortable asking those questions. So again, what you call things matters. So how did we think about how we would roll out Looker? We decided to create three different classes of users. Um, so the first one we called Looker Champion. And we appointed one person, or actually had them appointed, um, at each of the councils. So that's one local expert who becomes our primary point person when talking to headquarters the number one person who's then on point to attend any trainings, attend webinars, um, uh, you know, understand the information that is being um, transferred, um, to approve any user management changes, um, to publish local um, content to their council, um, and importantly for me, uh, also to provide tier one support. So any questions, right? So trying to get peer-to-peer um, -peer conversations happening and ensuring that the right people um, were sharing the right levels of information, right? So empowering them. Additionally, we created what we are calling 500 data analysts. Now, do we really have 500 data analysts across the country? I wish you would all be coming and trying to take them for your companies, right? This is aspirational. So this is really explore access. And what we're trying to do is teach um, teach folks that data is a thing, it's absolutely a thing, um, it, it requires attention, it is a great career path, this is a way to differentiate yourself, this is a, a whole area of exploration for you um, to learn, and then also um, to have them feel like they're an expert at their local council. Um, and by the way, we, we followed the same approach when we rolled out to HQ as well, um, but for the purposes of this conversation, I'm going to kind of focus on councils. Um, so then, uh, finally, we have a roughly 4,500 standard users that we were onboarding. Now, standard user is not a looker thing, 
That's what we decided to call read only. Why? Because I've always found that when you talk about read only to most people, they just hear only. So they may never, ever, ever need Explore Access, but they're hearing only and they're thinking, what am I not getting? Um, so we just called it standard user. So far, no questions. Okay, so just quickly, um, most, of the, most of this will be about rollout, but I wanted to just share quickly some of what's different maybe about us. So in terms of how we configured things, we have a closed system. So we've got 5,000 users. Well, actually, we have more than that now. Um, but we also have 112 councils. They function, they're each their own 501c3 nonprofit organization. So they're their own business, but collectively we are a movement. So we wanted councils to feel like when they log in, it's really their system, right? So that means that we're using um, user attributes uh, to restrict visibility. Um, we're currently doing that to determine um, they can only see their own council's data, but as we begin to build out comparative data models, we'll start using that for maybe more sensitive data, things that we don't think everybody should have direct access to, um, or maybe shouldn't be able to download. Um, in terms of publishing, the uh, GSUSA, my group's um, primary function is to publish national reports, right? That any council of any size with any level of data sophistication can take and consume. But at each of the individual councils, they can actually publish their own content as well and share it um, in their own shared spaces and push it out to their folks. Um, and then from the administration point of view, um, we really worked with uh, Looker Professional Services, so shout out to those guys who helped us come up with some um, smart approaches for doing this. How do you onboard 5,000 users um, in a couple of months. Well, we don't want to be um, entering them one by one or even in batches of 10. So we did some custom scripts that allow us to create those accounts, set the right uh, user attributes, set the right level of permission, etc. And then we also found that, again, you have 112 councils in the system as their own, um, acting as their own company. And um, we needed to make sure that we had um, early morning warmed uh, caches so that the key dashboards were popping up and populating for them. So we used data groups to make sure that it was populating once the ETL was done. So, okay, this was a little crazy. Um, we did four waves of rollout, um, April through July, though the first group was really a smaller um, test group. It was a soft launch of our closest um, councils, the folks had been working with us throughout the project, and we used them as guinea pigs, kind of shamelessly, to make sure that we were nailing down training, schedule, approach, et cetera, before we rolled out to the rest. Then we did the next three, and they had roughly 1,500 standard users and 150 um, data analysts. Um, and then we leaned on existing resources to make sure that we had some clear communication uh, channels, that we were building peer-to-peer -peer, um, connections per cohort, per role type, et cetera. It got a little nuts. We had like 52 different chatter groups we were maintaining at one point, but it made a difference because uh, folks who were just getting started were talking to other folks who were just getting started, right? And so they had different kinds of questions depending on where they were in the process. So for our rollout and training uh, approach, um, this is a lot. This was very rapid deployment. Um, so we ended up uh, doing about 120 hours of custom training during this window of time. Uh, there was one or two weeks there where we were uh, just finishing off the top level training for the first waves while still maintaining the other two waves. So um, huge shout out to my team who nailed it um, and got really positive response on doing that. It was a lot of work, but it matters because you're, you're trying to change the tide, right? Um, and information is the only way that you can really do that. So just quickly, the uh, first two weeks, everybody was a standard user. Didn't matter what they were gonna end up as. They, were, they just had read-only access, and that was so they could acclimate, get used to the system, um, feel like they could play without interfering with anything and just get used to navigation. 
we did some training around basic navigation, and then the second training that was optional was more of a deep dive into each of the existing dashboards that existed, so they could just get a feel for what kind of data was there. Then week three was when the fun began. That's when we turned on the 150 data analyst uh, explore access. Um, and then we started doing very targeted training. And the very first trainings were about data democratization. What does it mean? The Spider-Man um, talk about with great power comes great responsibility. Come on. Um, and starting to teach them to fish, right? Um, and roughly 30% of the folks in that 500 data analyst group actually went all the way through all of the training, which gives us a little sense of adoption rates too, right? Like it starts to tell us who the folks are that maybe we'd been talking to, but maybe we hadn't been talking to all this time, who cared enough to go through all of that training. Um, and then we had some, we had some check-ins as well. Um, every week we made sure we were getting a sense of um, we called it the looker vibe uh, for the, the champion, how are they feeling, but also how was everyone else at their council feeling. So we use that to gauge too, okay, we need more information, we need less information, we need more training, what topics do we need to make sure that we're hitting, et cetera. And then on Fridays, we did open office hours. So it started out with everybody could just dial in and we would just, we would do it live, right? We would just answer questions live. And then after enough time had passed, you could just grab a private uh, 10 minutes and we would work through a problem with you. So the biggest components for us, um, it, it's never the technology, right? Why is it going forward? Um, it's never the technology. It's always the change management. It's the systems around the system that are the biggest pieces. So these are some of our sort of Oprah aha moments, right? Um, First was discovering we were all so accustomed to an inflexible system that we just developed workarounds and we've been doing them for years, like downloading everything into Excel. And so when you start really pushing people to start using the system, you come right up against those ingrained um, workarounds. For my team too, for me too, where we had a knee-jerk reaction to go back to the old ways of working. So we had to we're really spending some time trying to figure out how we change that, right? And it's a tough one. Um, another big one that we started to discover was we were so accustomed to looking at spreadsheets because the old system didn't work that everybody was building out looks or dashboards that were just filled with tables. And that's not why we have Looker. That's not why we're doing this. Um, and so that was more of a, I mean, you have to laugh at yourself, right? But um, that's again, taking it to the next level and figuring out, okay, so your COO was accustomed to seeing a spreadsheet. What did they do when they had that spreadsheet? Were they filtering it? Were they, what were they drilling in at and really looking at? And then rethinking how we built out the dashboards to mirror that, right? Um, so we are definitely continuing with our data analyst training. Um, we're getting back down to the core basics. We just turned off um, our legacy system um, last week. So this is the moment when everyone is suddenly very interested in making sure that they understand Looker and how we have built out the logic. Um, so we are continuing to do that. And then the one other item that we noticed is that we had forgotten in developing for the 95% who were not feeling comfortable in the old system, we forgot we have a very um, important 5% who were perfectly happy in the old system because they did have the tech skills to be able to answer their questions. So they are also feeling a little out of sorts as they're trying to adjust to a brand new system and a new way of working. So the next items, um, we are in the process of rolling out at headquarters. Um, we were not content with just rolling out to 5,000 users in four months, so we're doing another nine to 12,000 uh, this month. Um, we're actually credentialing um, high-level volunteers, troop leaders who work with an, a series of troop leaders to really help and support them. Um, and we wanna get people out of the business of emailing personally identifiable data uh, in order to help those volunteers do their job. So we're creating a very auditable approach for this um, again, more scripting because nobody wants to be 
manually entering 12,000 um, users. Um, and then we're focusing again on building um, a community of practice and making sure that while we remove our data silos, we're not uh, recreating um, analytical silos, right? So the big questions that we are now getting excited about being, to, being able to answer, um, I've been saying all along, like we're just doing basic block and tackling right now. We're trying to turn off our legacy system. We haven't even gotten fancy yet. So I wanna get fancy, like I wanna be able to answer some basic questions. And some of this might be funny for those of you who are working for digitally native companies because this might be your starting place of understanding. But this is all the work we have to do to just um, meet you at the same place. But again, I mentioned before, we have a, a full cohort of girls that we can finally go, th go through and see what about the experience works, what's not working, what's the difference between girls who stay in an extra year, an extra two years. What is the impact on that in terms of revenue, in terms of cookie sales for them, et cetera? There's a lot there to explore, and I cannot wait to start uh, diving into that. Um, and then, you know, another um, topic that was pitched to me by Looker is maybe we can start taking a look at what the most popular cookie is by state. Um, and that's kind of a trick question because it's always Thin Mints. It is, it is literally the only thing that this country can agree on. It's Thin Mints. 